Welcome everyone to the sixth week of the Receptions and Comparatisms seminar. Um, this week we have um, a real delight in store. Uh, it's, as anyone who's seen the full schedule will recognize, this is um, uh, very much um, a seminar in response to decolonization uh, of last week. We are um, moving today to decoloniality, and I was going to um, try and to some extent uh, maybe falter slightly in uh, a rather amateur attempt to explain the difference, but I am delighted to say that that task has been um, taken off my hands and uh, at least our first two speakers, two very, uh, exciting emergent scholars from classics are going to um, explain the very important distinction between decolonization and decoloniality. Um, I think offer uh, an important sort of context, um, uh, enable us to think, go back to the 1990s, I suspect in, in Latin America, and I think the philosophy of liberation from which it originally hails. And very uh, importantly, we have a very distinguished Latin American scholar who will uh, follow um, the classicist presentation at the beginning. Um, I'm going to introduce the three speakers and then I will hand over to them. And just to remind you, um, in the first half of this session, the speakers will speak consecutively and then we will take a 10 minute break. And then uh, we hope in that 10 minute break, you uh, will offer some questions to the speakers in the chat. And then we return after 10 minutes where we are no longer being recorded or um, this part of the session will be, uh, we hope a free flowing discussion, which will enable people maybe to test ideas um, or even, you know, as in uh, my case, to ask um, a question that may seem or may have seemed rather naive to others. So um, I won't, as I say, uh, try and do something that I'm not the best equipped to do, but instead I will be able, I hope, to sing the praises of um, uh, especially uh, those who I've worked with at various times before, the two um, scholars uh, from classics who I mentioned already. The first of our speakers is uh, Madhura Umachandran, who is uh, currently a postdoc at the Society for the Humanities at Cornell. Previously, she held a postdoc position in Oxford, uh, working on the really exciting Leverhulme Anachronisms and Antiquity project. Um, she has published um, at this remarkably early stage in her career uh, pretty extensively on anachronisms, on Iris Murdoch and Aeschylus, and forthcoming uh, a book that many of us uh, are really um, looking forward to learning and learning more about anyway, is the fruit of her PhD uh, thesis from Princeton, the title of which will be Critical Mythologies, Classical Receptions and the Frankfurt School. She will be joined by Marcella Ward, who is currently Tinsley Outreach Fellow at Worcester College, Oxford. Similarly, Chella, at this early stage in her career, has published uh, widely on reception theory, on disability studies, on critical classics with Madhura Umachandra, and they've been working on a project together. She's also worked on Ted Hughes, and her forthcoming monograph with Cambridge University Press is called Looking and Looking Back, and it's on blindness in the theater. I've already mentioned our distinguished Latin American uh, scholar. We have Joanna Page with us from Cambridge. She's a reader in Latin American literature and visual culture at Robinson College, Cambridge. She works on the relationship between science and the arts and her most recent um, publication of a very long list of publications is Decolonization 
decolonizing right. science in Latin American just appeared in 2021. So I'm going to hand over now to our speakers, our classicists um, will speak first today. Um, so over to you, Mother. Hi Fiona, thanks so much for that lovely introduction. Hello everyone from Ithaca, New York. So if last week we explored the conceptual potential and limits of comparison as a methodology for decolonization, this week, we turn to decoloniality as a separate set of theoretical tools and analyses for reflecting critically on the idea of the classical and the disciplinary formation of classics. To start us off then, there are key epistemological distinctions of which we need to take note that allow us to say that decoloniality and decolonization are not interchangeable, even as they share the basic concern of deconstructing empire. Decolonization indicates the practice of taking empire apart, either one, in the breaking down of colonial rule by European empires in the middle of the 20th century, primarily in African or South Asian contexts, or two, in the ongoing struggles, historical and contemporary, to take apart such colonialism, for example, in North America or in Australia. So in the first sense, we can start to grasp why so much of post-colonial theory is generated by South Asian thinkers. It comes directly out of the circumstances of the literal breakdown of empire. With respect to settler colonialism, decolonization necessarily also takes up a critique of how empires preemptively create the categories of race and their hierarchies. It is therefore important to heed Tuck and Yang's always pertinent reminder that decolonization is not a metaphor for any other political project. Its reference is clear, and that is the critique of empire. In the various calls in the last decade to decolonize classics, to which I myself have added my voice, we might note that there are any number of ways of understanding decolonization as a metaphor that allow the underlying epistemological structures of empire to remain intact. Following Argentine thinker Walter Mignolo and Peruvian sociologist Anabel Quijano, decoloniality extends the impetus of breaking empire down. Coming out of the Cold War and analyses of world systems theory, decoloniality takes coloniality rather than colonialism as its object. This theoretical move is hugely significant because it states that one, capitalism is key to how colonialism works and two, that modernity and coloniality are twinned phenomena. Keanu articulates them as modern slash colonial to indicate how fused together they are. So in fashioning the fundamental connection between coloniality and modernity, decoloniality insists that even if formal empires were brought to an end, the world would continue to operate in unjust and oppressive ways. Modernity is not the train chugging towards a better future having stopped off at the unfortunate episode of global empire. Modernity itself is implicated in the colonial making of the world. The latter critique is the one we choose to focus on today in our brief talk because it directly takes the charge of coloniality to classics to examine itself as a discipline not only forged in the premises of enlightenment rationality, not only implicated in the material government and administration of the colonial theft of land, people, and labor across the world. In urging us to examine the political formation of historiographical and epistemological categories, decoloniality therefore puts a double query to classics. One, how does the discipline set itself up as a process of modern knowledge making and how is this formation implicated with the colonial epistemology? And so therefore too, what kinds of relationship to the past does the coloniality of classics set up? How is the object of study called antiquity generated from this matrix of coloniality? And this distinction that's often marked between decolonization and decoloniality as a distinction between praxis and epistemology is not a totalizing distinction, nor is it in any sense a hierarchical one. The material histories of the dismantling of empire often use different sources to interrogations of coloniality as an epistemological project, but neither is primary to the other and both are relevant to classics, which has been both 
materially involved in colonization and also logically constitutive of coloniality. Material histories, and especially local histories of the entanglement of classics with specific injustices of empire have had serious purchase in classics. I'm thinking, for instance, of Emily Greenwood's work on the Anglophone Caribbean, Rose Vecino's work on colonial India, and the specific examples in Mark Bradley's book on classics and imperialism in the British Empire. For that reason, our focus here and in the Critical Ancient World Studies project, which um, we shepherd collectively with a number of other scholars and that we're going to give a, a little introduction to today, um, but our focus will be on unpicking uh, the epistemological formation of the colonial, or in other words, on decoloniality. To give a short kind of brief sense then of what this epistemological decolonizing might mean for classics, we're going to turn briefly to Sylvia Winter, the Jamaican cultural theorist whose work to disentangle the seeming natural order from the discursive impetus of coloniality was one of our most important starting points in the Critical Ancient World Studies project. In perhaps her most famous essay, published in 2003, but drawing together readings of Franz Fanon, Aimé Césaire, W.E.B. Du Bois, and others who she'd been reading and writing about for much longer, Winter attempts to grapple with what she sees as a key epistemological foundation of coloniality, that is, a willful misdefinition of the human as category. Her essay carries a long title that summarizes a point that she returned to throughout the course of her career. Um, her career, which I'm delighted to say is very much still ongoing. She's often talked about as if she's in the past, but she published um, an interview with the scholar of Black Studies, Bedora Lagra, earlier this year. She's very much still reading and writing. But the essay is entitled Unsettling the Coloniality of Being, Power, Truth, Freedom Towards the Human After Man, Its Overrepresentation. Winter's argument then, as her title states, is that certain people, white men, settler colonialists, for instance, are overrepresented within the definition of the human. Far from being some kind of natural biological category, the human is in Winter's reading a category established discursively, and she provides a genealogy for its establishment that is first religious and then secular. We shall therefore need, though, she summarized in an interview with the best known scholar of her work, Catherine McKittrick, if my wager is right, to relativize the West's hitherto secular, liberal, mono humanist conception of our being human, its overrepresentation as the being human itself. Key to the dehumanizing of certain groups of people on which colonialism and its manifold violences are based, then, is for Winter a definition of the human that has always willfully refused the inclusion of certain humans within the category. And this misidentification is not a historical one, or is not at least only a one. In 1994, she published an open letter to her colleagues about a report she'd read detailing the beating of Rodney King, who'd been the victim of the police brutality of LAPD in 1991. The detail of the case to which she draws her colleagues' attention in that letter is the use of the acronym NHI. The report stated, and here I'm citing Winter's letter, the report stated that public officials of the judicial system in Los Angeles routinely use the acronym NHI to refer to any case involving a breach of the rights of young black males who belong to the jobless category of the inner city ghettos. NHI, she goes on to say, means no humans involved. But for classicists, and here I'm bringing us back to that 2003 essay, what's perhaps most important about Winter's decolonial concern to denaturalize the exclusion of certain humans from the category of human is that when she comes to explain how this exclusionary category came to be established, she points her finger firmly at a particular way of studying the ancient world, one inspired by humanism and one that we might today call classics. In the essay, she sets up what she calls the de-godding of humanism, stressing that the racialization process by which certain humans were dehumanized came about because, and here I'm citing her, the new idea of order was now to be defined in terms of degrees of rational perfection and imperfection, and degrees ostensibly ordained by the Greco-Christian cultural construct deployed as that of the law, as that of the law of nature. She cites Anthony Pagden's explanation of the way that colonialism found its structural support in the theologian John Mayer's translation of Aristotle. And here I'm gonna read out Pagden, but before I do, I just want to um, 
make you aware that Pagden is using here terms that um, I would not, we would not choose to use um, to describe certain people. But Pagden says, the suggestion that the Indians might be slaves by nature, a suggestion which claimed to answer questions concerning both their political and their legal status, was first advanced as a solution to a political dilemma. By what right had the Crown of Castile occupied and enslaved the inhabitants of territories to which it could make no prior claim based on history? John Mayer's text adopted from Aristotle's politics was immediately recognized by some Spaniards as offering a final solution to their problem. Mayer had, in effect, established that the Christians' claims to sovereignty over certain pagans could be said to rest on the nature of the people being conquered instead of on the supposed juridical rights of the conquerors. He thus avoided the inevitable and alarming deduction to be drawn from an application of these arguments, namely that the Spaniards had no right whatsoever to be in America. So it's to a particular mode of reading and translating Aristotle's politics that Winter is, is uh, positioning this impulse. And Winter concludes herself that it is therefore the very humanist strategy of returning to the pagan thought of Greece and Rome for arguments to legitimate the state's rise to hegemony that now provides a model for the invention of a by nature difference between natural masters and natural slaves. So the idea that that was a natural distinction, she's saying comes from a particular mode of reading antiquity. And Winter's point here is not that Aristotle is, himself is somehow uniquely genocidal or that the texts usually att attributed to the ancient Greeks and Romans are themselves by definition bad. Rather, her point is that a particular humanist mode of returning to them, something roughly akin to what we might call classics, built an epistemological scaffolding for empire, enabling difference that in actual fact was discursively established to be presented as a natural biological justification for subjugation. As a critique of Eurocentric colonial modernity, decolonial theories have the potential to transform classics in terms of its categorical distinctions. How we narrate the historiography of the past of greco Roman antiquity in relation to modernity, and also how we imagine their futurities. So if we take on board Chihano and Mignolo's urging to see the fundamental connection between coloniality and modernity, it must follow that classics, a discipline that defines itself as modern in distinction to antiquity, is plugged into coloniality. This connection also undergirds the various strategies that the discipline has to identify itself with its objects of study, whether by strategies of genealogy, imitation, or kin making, when classics seeks to make itself similar to moments of the greco roman past, there's a certain a particular historical narrative. This extends so much further beyond well-known and indisputable ways in which, for example, the British Empire fashioned itself as the heir to the Roman, or how the founding fathers valorized the aesthetics of classical Athens in the making of the United States. In Winter's reading, the classical functions in a way that is akin to what might in art history be called a gaze, a totalizing narrative for and onto the world that locks the present into a continuum with the ancients and brings with it a narrative of linear progress, exclusionary logics of time, an alignment between the European and the universal, and a mythical origin story of cultural identity for Europe's special hegemony. The starting point for critical ancient world studies then was the impetus of decoloniality. We were seeking to dispute the notion that the classical is in any sense a neutral way of organizing a discipline for the study of the ancient world or its knowledge making, knowledge -making practices. Cause, critical ancient world studies, is a critique of classics under the rubric of decoloniality, but it's also a process of building towards an alternative future, not for classics as a discipline, but for the decolonial study of a wider ancient world. Since it's essentially an activist project, we wrote a cause manifesto. So, critical ancient world studies is a mode of studying antiquity, broadly defined, that makes four critical steps away from the field, of, field known as classical studies or classics. classics. One, cause critiques the field's Eurocentrism and refuses to inherit silently a 
a field crafted so as to constitute a mythical prehistory for an imagined West, in particular by rejecting the universal as a synonym for the Western or European. While classics has too often been content to construct an ancient world whose value lies in its mirror image of modern Europe, critical ancient world studies investigates the ancient history of a world without accepting the telos of the West. Step two, cause rejects the assumption of an axiomatic relationship between so-called classics and cultural value, divesting from cultural capital as a mode of knowledge making in the field. Step three, cause denies positivist accounts, positivist accounts of history and all modes of investigation that aim at establishing a perspective that is neutral or transparent and commits instead to showcasing the contingency of historiography in a way that is alert to injustices and epistemologies of power that shape how knowledge is constructed as objective, objective. and fourth and finally, cause requires of those who participate in it a commitment to decolonizing the gaze of and at antiquity, not simply by applying decolonial theory or uncovering subaltern narratives in a field that has special relevance to the privileged and the powerful, but rather by dismantling the structures of knowledge that have led to this privilege. So in this approach, we took our theoretical and epistemic example from the Orient, a journal of critical Muslim studies that has taken a similar critical attitude to its own parent discipline. In practice, we acknowledge that these four epistemological orientations will require two further practical commitments to confronting the iniquities that structure access to the field and imbalance who gets to work and study within it, and to rejecting the centrality of ancient Greece and ancient Rome within the study of the ancient world. Since then, we've also come to learn that the project can only be meaningful if it is also collective and non-hegemonic. And we have deliberately worked so far in a global community with scholars, especially early career and student scholars from a range of different fields, particularly those who felt that their work has been excluded from the discipline of classics. Like dear decoloniality, critical ancient world studies is always a work in progress and always in motion. It will never be completed or finished, but seeks always a decolonial horizon. And throughout the work that we've done on the project so far, we've been concerned with how the ancient world is studied, not what is studied. We've acknowledged multiple times the need to broaden the, ge the geographical definition of antiquity, but sim simply shifting an epistemological structure of the discipline from one object of study to another will not send classics hurtling towards that decolonial horizon. Of late antiquity, Blossom Stefanio has written of the way that uh, a discipline would shift its orientations if it was striving for justice. A discipline which is striving for justice, Stefanio says, looks different from one which is only striving to make the minimum number of incremental changes necessary to sustain its own image of righteousness. A discipline which hungers for justice looks a lot different from one which is squirming around trying to get itself off the hook. Getting classics off the hook isn't the goal of critical ancient world studies. In fact, one of the really difficult conversations we had to have early on in the project was about whether or not the discipline of classics is salvageable at all. We remain absolutely convinced of the value of a critical approach to ancient worlds, but our edited volume that is forthcoming is subtitled The Case for Forgetting Classics, precisely because we think that the transformation that it will take to decolonize classics will be a total and a radical one, and one that will require the classical gaze to be rejected in its entirety. We recognize that for those most empowered by the discipline's current formation, and a, a, that's a group that after all includes most of us working on the project, the call to fundamentally alter the discipline's epistemological formation might be troubling and difficult to deal with. But we, and most of the scholars that we've worked with, grew up living under a constant awareness of climate collapse. And with this moment of anthropocenic modernity and ecological crisis, comes for us a ready familiarity with the idea that ends that seem to be world ending can in fact not only be necessary, but also be generative. And we'll end here with this one final, I think quite beautiful and hopeful quotation 
uh, from the introduction to a book called Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet that's about living among the realities of extinction. And also by way, um, I hope of, of linking us um, with some of the unruly plants uh, that are going to uh, be in Joanna's talk. Um, but it begins uh, with a reference to ghosts. Ghosts, obviously, as many here will know, uh, an image that has been uh, incredibly generative for thinking about classics and classical reception over the last few years. And it goes like this. Ghosts, too, are weeds that whisper tales of the many pasts and yet to comes that surround us. Considered through ghosts and weeds, worlds have ended many times before. Endings come with the death of a leaf, the death of a city, the death of a friendship, the death of small promises and small stories. The landscapes grown from such endings are our disaster as well as our weedy hope. And it's on that note of weedy hope um, that we will finish. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow on from that, if that's correct. Um, OK, well, thank you very much. Um, it falls to me, I think, to say a first thank you to Chad and Madhara for starting the session off in such a fascinating way and introducing us to that, that project, which sounds uh, really, really interesting. Um, but what I'm going to do in, in my own talk um, is to explore uh, some hypotheses about the decolonial. Um, and to think about what might distinguish it as a mode of artistic expression um, or as a form of knowledge production um, from the post-colonial um, or the post-modern. And I'm gonna suggest that we can often understand the decolonial as a series of operations um, that do not only seek to challenge the universalism of Western or European epistemologies, um, but that also positively reconnect phenomena within broader networks of meaning and rehistoricize them in a way that creates alternative modernities. So in essence, what I'm gonna be arguing is that rather than confining themselves to the more perhaps recognizably postmodern task of dismantling authority um, and disembedding phenomena from specific times and places, um, decolonial works actively re-embed them within local contexts and histories. And they do this in a way that directly challenges um, both Western universalism um, and importantly, the disciplinary divisions um, that have characterized the particular form that modernity has taken in Europe um, since the Enlightenment. Um, so I'm going to anchor my observations in um, a specific case, um, but it's one that I found to be paradigmatic of a broader trend. And I'm going to share my screen with you now to show you um, some images. And so the case that I'm going to focus on is an ongoing series of artworks created by the Colombian uh, artist Alberto Baraya called the Herbarium of Artificial Plants. And he began this in 2002. And Baraya inserts his work into a tradition of botanical illustration in Colombia that dates from the Royal Botanical Expedition to New Granada, uh, which was led by Jose Celestino Mutis, um, a Spanish mathematician, botanist and physician. Um, the expedition began in uh, 1783 and continued for several decades. Um, and the exquisite illustrations produced uh, to catalogue the region's flora, you can see um, an example there, adhered in many ways to the norms of botanical illustration in the 18th century in Europe. So we have the figure um, of, uh, that's at the centre um, of the plate, and that demonstrates the habit of the plant, um, its general appearance and architecture. Um, and then you have details and transverse sections of the different parts of the plant um, arranged often at the foot, um, allowing the plant to be successfully identified according to the Linnaean system. Um, and this format is employed for many of the plates that Baraya uh, designed for his herbarium. But the significant difference is that the specimens shown are not of native flora, um, they're artificial flowers, um, the great majority made in China. Uh, from plastic, fabric, and wire. And Baraja collects his samples from the environments in which they're often to be found across the world. Um, cafes, offices, hotel bathrooms, churches, airports, and shop windows. Um, despite similarities in form, um, there are in fact important differences in Baraja's reworking of these norms of botanical illustration. Um, the quest for a universal taxonomy of plants 
um, led to an approach that was zealously exact in its depiction of the essence of each plant, um, but it disregarded the imperfections of a particular specimen um, or any characteristics that were not considered common to the species. Um, as Mary Louise Pratt states, the European exercise of natural history elaborated a rationalizing, extractive, dissociative understanding, which overlaid functional experiential relations among people, plants, and animals. So in an operation that was deeply appropriative at heart, life forms across the planet, um, as she says, were to be drawn out of the tangled threads of their life surroundings and rewoven into European-based patterns of global unity and order. Um, in contrast, Baraya's plates celebrate the local, the contingent, um, the subjective. Um, photographs that he includes in these plates um, tie specimens to specific places or people that he meets on his travels. And they bear witness to the way in which his artworks arise from chance connections and discoveries. In uh, Taxonis Tabaldinga, for example, um, Baraya catalogues the different kinds of artificial plants and flowers um, that he finds in a decorative display in a hairdressing salon uh, owned by Nicolasa. Here you can see her appearing in a photograph um, next to the species um, that he's identified and um, brandishing her bouquet uh, with a smile. So Baraya's plates reconnect the natural and cultural histories that are torn apart in 18th century abstractions. Um, the elegant illustration produced for Mutis of the Artura gen genus, um, as you can see here, it's full of botanical information that would aid identification, um, flowers, fruit, uh, all folded into its design, um, but it reveals nothing beyond the plant's morphology, um, and this is set a plain, against a plain white background. So in a plate uh, dedicated to, to the same species, Baraya includes photographs of the natural environments in which um, the real plants, um, which contain uh, toxic uh, hallucinogens, are typically found, um, as well as notes on their use in Europe and America by magicians and shamans for the healing of wounds um, or the divination of a patient's illnesses. Um, Baraya also traces very plainly how his specimens are caught up in patterns of global trade and consumption. And this was a process um, that, of course, was entirely erased um, in those handsome compositions of the new Granada plates. And um, so next to the green foliage and petals of the Orquídea Viajera, um, we find um, a map of its commercial and cultural roots, um, linking the artificial flowers market in Yiwu, China, to retail outlets um, from Miami to Madrid. Um, the decolonial thrust of Baraya's work um, also emerges powerfully in the attention that he pays to the relationship between natural history and commerce, together with the racial politics of colonialism and neocolonialism. So in another plate, uh, Cacao con Guito is accompanied by a small reproduction uh, mounted on cardboard of a black uh, round-bellied cartoon character uh, that you should just be able to see there. Um, and the image forms part of the branding for a range of products marketed in Spain um, under the name of Conguitos uh, by Chocolates La Casa, uh, which is a Spanish confectionery company. And here's a similar version of the image in use. Um, the name Conguitos is the diminutive version of a Latin American Spanish term for a black person um, that derives from the country name Congo. Um, the caricatured black character has full red lips. Um, it's carrying, as Baraya uh, observes, uh, a tribal style spear. And this jaunty uh, exotic figure um, is used to promote the brand in Spain um, in a way that implicitly celebrates um, the racial dynamics of cacao production. Um, as cacao growers tend to be black, um, many African slaves were brought to work on plantations in Colombia and other countries in Latin America. Um, and this close relationship between racism and the emergence of the modern world system um, is clearly outlined in the decolonial perspectives developed by Quijano. Um, ethnic categorizations were, um, as he argues, the inevitable cultural consequence of coloniality, and they were used to justify different kinds of labor control, um, including slavery and other forms of coerced labor. Um, as Mother Ancella mentioned, uh, Quijano argues that uh, modernity itself only emerges in Europe as a result of its imperial ventures in America. Its constitution as a modern power 
um, rests historically on the wealth extracted from the region. Um, gold, silver, potatoes, tomatoes, tobacco, with the free labor of Indians, mestizos, and African slaves. Um, so in this way, um, he says, the Americas were not incorporated into an already existing capitalist world economy. There could not have been a capitalist world economy without the Americas. Um, by the 18th century, however, Europeans had not only persuaded themselves that they had independently forged their own civilization, um, but that they were naturally and racially superior to other civilizations, um, as evidenced by their imperial domination over them. Um, this story of the, the basis of modern capitalist European society in colonialism and racism um, is the story that's laid bare in Baraya's works. Um, but many of them also, as we've seen, move beyond um, the unveiling of acts of dispossession and exploitation um, to perform acts of reconnection with non-Western forms of knowledge and experience um, re and re-embedding within local communities and environments. I'm going to suggest that placing Baraya's work within the framework of the neo-Baroque in Latin America um, helps us to grasp how it diverges from the politics of the postmodern, um, which in its quest to dismantle the centers of power um, has often been the politics of post-colonial literature. And Baraya's absurd quest to collect and identify every type of artificial plant in the world uh, mimics the overweening ambition of Enlightenment natural histories. Um, but it replaces their austere language with Baroque proliferation and theatricality. Um, for Cervero Sardui, um, the obsessive repetition of a useless thing determines the Baroque as play, in contrast to the determination of the classical work as a labor. Um, other elements of Baraya's plates also bear affinities with the neo-Baroque. Um, they're relatively simple in design, um, but they often employ the quintessential Baroque technique of trompe l'oeil in their presentation of artificial plants that often trick us into believing, uh, initially at least, that they're real. Um, his works often create folds in matter um, in ways that for Deleuze typify uh, the Baroque. Um, they recycle and rework themes and forms from the past. Um, they trouble the division between the artist as subject and object. Um, they entangle the spiritual and the current cultural with the material and the commercial. They also interweave the artificial and the organic um, artistic convention and its critique. Um, in an influential essay uh, published in 1957, Josela Samalima identified the, the Baroque as an art of counter conquest in the new world. Um, he was referring to the, the kind of cultural hybridization that's evident in the work of uh, indigenous and Creole artists and architects, uh, which he argued disrupted the imposition of colonial uh, authority. Um, drawing on seminal essays by La Sama Lima and others, uh, critics have gone on to identify traits of the neo-Baroque uh, in much 20th century Latin American fiction um, because of the way that it bridges elite and popular cultures, uh, modernity and the non-rational. Um, but redefining the Baroque too broadly uh, runs the risk of lessening its analytical value um, by stripping it of its historicity and its capacity for social and cultural critique. Um, I want to recuperate the, the term here um, in a very specific way um, that focuses principally on its critique of enlightenment philosophy and European modernity. Um, by using the term neo-Baroque, um, to describe works um, by Baraja and other Latin American artists. Um, I want to draw attention to a specific continuity with the historical Baroque, and that is the re-articulation re of aesthetic strategies to subvert and importantly to pluralize European narratives of modernity. And I'm building here on the work of um, Irla Marchiampi, um, who argues that the Baroque reappears in the 20th century in Latin America to bear witness to the crisis or end of modernity and to the very condition of a continent that could not be assimilated by the project of the Enlightenment. So in this way, the Neo-Baroque becomes an archeology span of the modern that reveals something of the character of Latin America's dissonant uh, modernity. Um, and a connection between the Neo-Baroque and decolonial thought um, has been very briefly proposed in recent scholarship, but not yet fully developed. Um, both Quijano and Volta Mignolo uh, returned to the scene of the historical Baroque in America um, to give instances of the kind of critical appropriation and re-signification of European culture 
um, that would provide the foundation for a new Latin American cultural identity born out of colonial difference. Um, but neither considers how um, the particular aesthetic and conceptual modes of the Baroque might be carried forward um, to create opportunities um, for a critical revision of European identity in our own time. Uh, Monica Kelp uh, pro proposes that we understand the Baroque as an alternative for modernity um, that rejects the Enlightenment's rupture with the past and with non-rationalist thought, affirming instead the impure hybrid coexistence of the disjunctive modern and pre-modern, global and local, faith and reason, science and wonder. Um, these projects by Baraya uh, demonstrate how the neo-Baroque uh, may serve a decolonial critique of modernity in the Latin American context. Um, as a response to the abstractions and the extractions of enlightenment and colonial science, um, these works perform acts of reinsertion and reconnection. Um, and this is the approach that I would argue is very much at the heart of the decolonial politics of the neo-Baroque. And the neo-Baroque has often been associated in Latin America with the parodic, dehistoricizing poetics of postmodernism um, in its bid to unsettle the discourses of the metropolitan center. And what we find in these works instead is a rehistoricizing venture that seeks to create alternative modernities by reconnecting spheres of experience that were separated in the Enlightenment and by exploring plural ontologies. Um, Cesar Augusto Salgado suspects that the deep interest in the Baroque in Latin American cultural theory uh, may have no equivalence in current post-colonial thinking. Um, as the European colonization of the Americas predates the Enlightenment, um, contesting Enlightenment philosophies and practices um, also implies, Salgado argues, um, a response to the failure of enlightened ideals to transform and modernize Latin American society and culture. Um, here, I think we could add um, a response to the epistemic and ecological violence involved in that project of transformation and modernization. Um, and this comes through very clearly in the work of several artists um, who, like Baraya, are reinventing bestiaries, herbaria, and floras uh, that were common in natural histories of the new world. Uh, and these new reinvented uh, genres often bring nature and science back into a relationship uh, with those forms of popular indigenous and spiritual knowledge and experience um, that have been systematically excluded from Western science since the Enlightenment um, in a series of re-embedding operations that I found to be central uh, to the decolonial as a practice that is thoroughly intercultural and interdisciplinary. Um, thank you very much.